All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'd like to welcome you all to the closing plenary for Apricot 2019. Um, without much further ado, I think we should introduce our um, keynote speakers. We actually have two keynote speakers for uh, this closing plenary. Um, so first off, I would like to invite um, Professor Kulnam Chan um, to deliver his keynote. Uh, Professor Chan has contributed to the Internet's growth in Asia through his extensive work in advancing Internet initiatives, research and development. He developed the first Internet in Asia, called SDN, in 1982, and his pioneering work inspired many others to promote the Internet's further growth in the region. Professor Chan was awarded the John Postel Internet Award by the Internet Society in 2011 and was admitted to the Internet Hall of Fame in 2012. Professor Chan. Yeah, good afternoon, <coughs> and welcome to the uh, uh, Korea. The last time we had an apricot was uh, 20 years ago. So the, I was wondering, how shall I start this, my talk? Then uh, initially I was given the 15 minutes. No, initially I was given half an hour, but they changed to the 15 minutes. Then uh, just a while ago, uh, I was told I can spend 20 minutes. So let's start from the 20 years ago, when we had the first uh, <coughs> apricot here. We had a debate. Shall we offer the uh, Wi-Fi to the users? I mean, today, w this is not a debate. But 20 years ago, uh, for apricot, it was new. ITF tried, so the, shall we try the uh, Wi-Fi at the uh, Apricot for the first time? And we had a lot of debate. And uh, I guess uh, the Philip and the Paul may remember since it's uh, 20 years ago. Do you know what we did? We gave up. Technology may not be stable enough. So let's try it later. I still regret that one. I mean, apricot is the one we should experiment on those. And uh, that's uh, 20 years ago. And since I have about 20 minutes, uh, one more talk. 50 years ago, probably most of you are not born here. Okay, 1960s. You go to Tamekan, okay. Yeah, internet was born in 1969, 50 years ago. Then we called the uh, ARPANET. So let me explore what happened in the late, in, late 1960s. First of myself, uh, I was fresh out of a master degree at the UCLA, 1967. Then I worked in a company. Then would you believe my project at that company was the mobile, inter uh, mobile networking. 50 years ago, mobile networking. And the reason is very simple. Uh, this company is an aerospace company. So they want to communicate between the airplane and the ground station. And uh, at that time, choice we have is a uh, uh, voice. But uh, in many cases, you want to send out those uh, uh, text data. And uh, so the, they want to have a computer networking. That was the, my project. So the, I was designing uh, those uh, packet all the time. Then uh, compared to that one, ARPANET was uh, not so impressive. They didn't do the, any mobile networking. And uh, wireless networking come a couple of years later. Initially, it's a fixed network. OK, the body of uh, ARPANET. At that time, we thought ARPANET was uh, uh, sort of uh, too ambitious. Why? They try to connect all kinds of computers. 
And uh, everything else, there's a, say, like a more f about 10, 20 computer networking projects in the USA. All of them, except ARPANET, is a homogeneous network. Only one kind of computer. Like IBM, then it's only IBM computer. DEC, only DEC computer. And uh, my company, again, is the uh, same. Uh, we made a computer for, for the networking. And uh, ARPANET, they try to connect everything. The reason is very simple. They want to connect all computer used by the uh, uh, ARPANET project. And there are all sorts of those computers. So that's their uh, ambition. Then the problem they have is uh, they are working on a base kind of software. They are now really, has a, they don't really have those resources to develop uh, hardware. So the performance is awful. And uh, every other companies, they work both hardware and software, so they're much easier. They tune both in uh, hardware and software. But anyway, eventually those ARPANET approach won the game. So they become those mainstream. But uh, so the, the, my message is uh, in the 1960s, ARPANET is just one of the project. And, uh, <laughs> So the internet was born in 1969, 50 years ago, and today, as we all know, over 4 billion, over 50% of people using uh, uh, internet. That's in the 1960s. And uh, Asia Pacific is sort of a, a, the late start in this area, like a, a USA, and the uh, UK, France, they started in the 1960s on the research. But Asia Pacific, like Australia, New Zealand, Japan, uh, 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 Korea, we started late uh, 70s. So the sort of, uh, uh, we had uh, 10 years to catch up. And uh, which is a very, we did uh, pretty much was a catch up uh, in the 1970s, 80s, uh, in the last century. And so the, uh, in the 1980s, yeah, many things happened. First of all, we formed the uh, AsiaNet using uh, those uh, uh, UUCP link. About uh, six, seven countries in Asia, like uh, Japan, Korea, Hong Kong, Indonesia, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand. They are the sort of uh, members. And uh, we made the uh, AsiaNet. <coughs> And uh, to give a credit, Australia is the one uh, who didn't use the UCP. They developed their own software. And uh, <coughs> the rest of them, we use a uh, uh, software, UUCP, uh, made in the USA, designed in the USA. Then in 1985, we had a Pacific Computer Communication Symposium, and we all get together. And if we think from now, probably this may be the first internet conference in the world. We had about three or 400 people in Seoul. Then uh, we had an a, a annual meeting among the, those, uh, those uh, researchers of uh, computer networking, North America, Europe, and Asia. Typically, it's held in uh, Europe. Then we met there. Because uh, around that time, those are making a trouble. Like uh, if I say like, okay, let's get, let's get together in uh, Tokyo or Seoul. It's uh, very expensive, even for the uh, uh, Japanese or Australian. So the way we have uh, those meeting, which is typically held in uh, Europe, we get together over there. And uh, called the IANW uh, AP. AP means uh, uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, IAMW uh, Academic Network Shop. That's the sort of first of the internet community uh, developed. It was in the 1980s. Then uh, it's a, there's a major change happening in the USA. Internet replaced the ARPANET. Since then, uh, internet sort of picked up the uh, momentum. And uh, eventually, ARPANET was uh, phased out. 
Then in the Asia Pacific 1980s, again, uh, several countries uh, installed the uh, uh, TCP IP, I mean IP version 4. That was the 1980s. Okay. Oh no. On the 1990s, finally we start uh, forming uh, those uh, 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 groups in the Asia Pacific. First of all, uh, APNG. This is, uh, I guess, it's a remarkable organization. It's a very unusual organization too. The reason is that APNG spin off so many organiz internet organizations in the uh, 1990s, including like um, APNIC and uh, APTLD, APCERT, APIA, APIA is a sort of uh, uh, umbrella organization for the applicant. APAN and APSER. And, uh, and the APNIC, since there are many people here from APNIC. In the case of APNIC, it was in, very interesting. We didn't even bother to form the working group first. In the first APNG meeting, we decided, okay, let's, let's have an APNIC. And let's spin off. Let's not do it within those APNG. And uh, so the, I don't know how, if you can call this one is an AP and a spin off. And uh, very interesting uh, uh, action. Then the Apricot started in 1986, 1996, uh, started by the, uh, uh, the Randy Conrad. Uh, he's in uh, uh, ICANN now as a CTO. And of course, like many more organizations uh, in the 21st century, and of which many of you are uh, familiar or get involved. So the, around the 2010, don't you think we should the record what we did in the 19th, uh, 20th century? Before it's too late. Before it's too late means, uh, I guess we want to hear from the uh, uh, original pioneer who started. And uh, there's a limit to wait. <clears throat> and uh, this project, uh, we formed in 2011 and uh, uh, about uh, around the five or six of us get together. Then uh, we did, uh, since it's, uh, let's do it in an internet style. So interesting thing is a uh, uh, primary copy of uh, internet history is in a website, which we can update all the time. Almost we, we update weekly, monthly. And the hard copy is the snapshot. Snapshot, not the other way around. So the, if you want to see uh, this uh, books, you can go to the website. You can get the latest version. And the hard copy version is a sort of old because the hard copy we can publish every five years or so. And uh, this is a collective effort of about 100 authors. Then uh, additionally, we had about 50, 60 those advisors. It was a very good those, uh, uh, collaboration. Let's put different, differently. <laughs> Asia Pacific is the only region we have a regional internet history uh, books. Some of other continent uh, couldn't do it yet. And we published those three books. I'll show you the picture later. Uh, for the 1980s or beginning and the 1990s, and uh, then we also did in uh, uh, 2000 as a sort of a bonus. <coughs> Topic we covered, many, which I'm going to show you later. Then uh, we additionally, we decided to do the uh, video interview. The reason is uh, still like uh, original, those are pioneer available. So th th let's record them. And also ask them to write uh, article from their those, uh, first hand experience. Then, uh, uh, of course, uh, we have a very extensive biography. This is one of the, uh, our intention. 
probably we have about a 15, more than 1,000, one probably 1,500 or so. Okay, here's the books. Uh, one, uh, first decade, second decade, and the third decade. And uh, <laughs> you can get uh, those uh, first two uh, through the Google Books or the Amazon, if you want to. It's uh, very expensive because it's published by the commercial site. And the third book, so that we decide to, uh, we decide to publish. Then uh, remarkably, price went down to the 10%. Instead of by $80, it's just uh, $8, $10. So the, when you publish, you may consider uh, which way you want to do it. And uh, the Robert here, he uh, uh, made uh, this very good those picture so that I'm borrowing from him. Is Robert here now? He's doing an uh, interview project. He's one of the uh, couple of those uh, people who are doing a very extensive uh, interview project. Probably he did about two, 300 people in the Asia Pacific. Another one is uh, China Labs, which did about three, 400 uh, globally. Oh no. Okay, the topic we covered is uh, here. And uh, you don't have to read them all. Uh, you can find it in the website. Uh, only as long as you know, it's uh, many. Okay. And the reason why I show this one here is uh, <clears throat> in, from the next page on, I'm, I'm going to make a, a recommendation for your country. Okay. Why don't you start the uh, those, uh, National Internet History Project? Then uh, you want to cover the similarly all those topics, then the challenge you you have is uh, in each subject, you'd better find it out who started in your country. And uh, grab him, grab her, and uh, interview him, her. Okay, then uh, uh, if he can, or if she can, okay, ask them to write an article. So there's a so, sort of a, a time limitation. If it's getting late, then uh, uh, eventually they're getting too old to take uh, those uh, intellectual activity. Okay, that my proposal is a <clears throat> national internet history project. It's about time to start because many of you, uh, country in Asia Pacific used to the internet in the 90s or 2000. So they're already about uh, 20, 30 years old, okay? And uh, first of all, the internet pioneers in your countries, in all those areas, they are getting old, okay? Now before they getting too old, you have to interview them and ask them to write an article. Then uh, you should do the uh, video interview. Like the University of Minnesota, Babbage Institute is actually started those uh, uh, interview uh, project in the world. And they made a mistake. They didn't use a video. They just uh, record. And uh, these days, people want to have a video. Next, don't use the, those regular definition. Use either high definition or even if you can get it, use the uh, uh, 4K. Because eventually 4K become a norm. Uh, norm. And uh, we, Asia Internet History Project, we are ready to support you if you are uh, going to do it. And uh, please contact us, okay? And the timing is very important. You start now. And uh, then in a couple of years, you can get a fairly in a good shape. Then uh, you may consider uh, 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 publishing. Okay. So the conclusion is uh, you should start recording in a very timely manner. If something happened, uh, just take a video and uh, do the documentation. Because so you, 
you forget so easily uh, what you did. And uh, here is some of those, uh, the reference you can see. Okay, uh, uh, I guess I use up uh, 20 minutes. Uh, thank you very much. How many photos was that? My goodness. All right. Um, so, thank you very much, Professor Chon, for your uh, keynote speech. I would now like to invite uh, Professor jo James Wonki Hong to deliver his keynote. Um, James Hong is Dean of the Graduate School of Information Technology, Professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, and Director of Distributed Processing and Network Management Lab at Poztech, Pohang, Korea. James worked as CTO and Senior Executive Vice President for Korea Telecom from March 2012 to February 2014, where he was responsible for leading the R&D effort of KT and its 50 subsidiary companies, and where he initiated R&D on SDN. He was Chairman of National Intelligence Communication Enterprise Association and Chairman of the Telecommunications Technology Association Standardization Board in Korea. He is a co-founder and executive director of the SDN NFV Forum since 2014 in Korea. His research interests include network intelligence, network innovations such as SDN and NFV, blockchain, fog and cloud computing, mobile services, smart IPTV, and ICT convergence such as smart home, smart grid, and e-health. Professor, I could invite you to the stage to deliver your keynote speech. Thank you. Thank you very much for a kind introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is James Hong. It's my great uh, honor and pleasure to uh, uh, give a keynote at this closing uh, session of EPRICA 2019. So the title of my talk is Softwareization of the Internet. I'm not sure if you, anyone has a full, any idea what this means. Um, the Professor Chun gave a, a very nice uh, history of the internet and uh, Asia-Pacific activities on the internet. Um, so I've been actually working on internet-related things for many years myself, uh, back in uh, Canada in the 70s and, and then 80s, uh, returned to Korea in 1995. Uh, how many of you are Researchers doing research in, uh, in uh, internet. Okay, how many of you are uh, professors? Okay, and students. Okay, how many of you are um, operations and management people working in various? Good, we have fairly good number. Uh, how about administrators? I'm not an engineer. I'm not a, uh, a researcher, but Administrator, okay. How about engineers? Oh, good number of people. Okay, uh, so since uh, Professor Chun gave a nice history of the internet, the internet started 50 years ago. After 50 years ago, it looks like this. Everyone knows about that, right? Okay. Um, now, 
I'm going to introduce very quickly, well introduce, um, most of you should know uh, all, all these things. So the telecommunication networks or telco networks have been evolving quite a bit over the last 50 years. I mean, initially it did not look like this. Uh, this is more of a, a recent um, architecture of the a telecommunication network, typical. Uh, and then we had uh, mobile communications being added, 2G, 3G, 4G, and now 5G. Okay, and there's a big hype on 5G, and uh, I'm sure we'll hear more about 5G uh, in the next uh, few years. Okay, uh, all these mobile networks are definitely uh, providing lots of impact on uh, research as well as the business applications and whatever we may be doing in the future. Um, now, and then these, there are these yellow boxes, what I call middle boxes or network function boxes. Over the past 20, 30 years, although internet was born, providing exchanging file transfers initially, uh, then uh, with the, uh, the introduction of the World Wide Web in the early 90s, uh, fueled by the broadband internet access, uh, it really became the, the infrastructure for innovation as well as uh, various uh, businesses uh, and services uh, that are used on whatever we do, whether that's at work, uh, entertainment, uh, and so on. Okay. And all these uh, yellow middle boxes have increased in terms of the types as well as numbers. So the networks, whether they be enterprise networks, uh, public networks, uh, telecommunication networks, enterprise networks, all these yellow boxes, the uh, network function boxes increased uh, quite a bit. And where it used to be routers and switches, uh, the networks don't operate safely, securely, efficiently without these uh, network function boxes. Um, the growth, the, the mobile uh, networking technologies, 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, so about every 10 years, we've seen the introduction of these uh, new generation communication technologies. Now the 5G that's promised to provide uh, 10 gigabps um, uh, speeds to whatever we may be using it for. So the evolution of mobile communications from uh, 1G in the um, uh, 80s to 2G in the 90s and then 3G in the 2000, 21st century, and now we're enjoying 4G for the past uh, almost 10 years. Now with the 5G, uh, we'll, which will provide more connectivity, faster speed, um, and um, for a variety of applications uh, yet to be seen. Okay, And we've also seen the uh, advances in wireless uh, networks, especially the Wi-Fi technology. And uh, nowadays, they're providing 100 megabps uh, connections, wireless connections, of course, and we'll soon see uh, gigabps uh, the, um, speeds with the Wi-Fi access. And of course, all these are um, supported by the optical networking technologies and uh, the latest ones that travel thousands of kilometers at the speed of uh, 200, 400 gigabps and terabps uh, soon, okay? and which will continue to uh, advance and, and provide uh, greater uh, bandwidth at a lower cost. Now, I just found this uh, old uh, central office, the telephone network uh, central office with these people. And nowadays, it's very hard to see this type of uh, um, scene 
where many of these are even changing to data centers. Data centers didn't exist uh, many years ago. Now, data center is playing a big role in internet computing applications and services. Okay. Here's an example, one from uh, Google. Now, all these advances in communications and networking technologies, along with the innovations of smartphones and devices and, uh, you know, thousands of, and tens of thousands of applications that are running on those smart devices, have resulted in explosive growth of traffic on the Internet. And you see this famous um, graph where the traffic is uh, uh, exponentially growing and still growing, but the, uh, the customers' revenues, unfortunately, not uh, keeping up. Okay? And the reasons for these de dead explosion, again, smartphones and devices, thanks to Steve Jobs, um, and then multimedia contents, uh, higher resolution photos, but recently K-pop, Music, videos, uh, Gangnam style, and so on. Um, K-dramas. Uh, by the way, how many of you watch Korean dramas outside of Korea? Uh, quite a few. And I'm sure K-pop music video, you may not be, but your daughters and sons are enjoying these. Um, and they're generating lots and lots of traffic on the internet. Okay. Of course, the highways are getting faster and wider, 3G, 4G, 5G, right? Um, but unfortunately, these are causing higher capex and opex for the service providers, okay? especially uh, telcos. Not only telcos, but enterprises, uh, public networks, uh, research networks, and same thing to support these increased network traffic. Okay. And for telcos, especially mobile uh, service providers, they need to buy spectrums in order to be able to provide these services, which is on the order of billions of dollars. Lots of money. And as I mentioned, those yellow boxes, the black boxes, middle boxes, are very expensive, but you need more and more of those. Now, what about the revenues? Unfortunately, the revenues of these uh, telcos haven't been keeping up. Rather, their profits been going down. So how do they survive? That's a big question. Okay. And then the applications of internet by these innovative internet companies have been um, spring up and doing very well, okay. as well as more recent uh, applications that are changing the way we uh, behave and the way we work and enjoy and so on, okay? And this, I'm sure you use one of these uh, smart uh, mobile messengers and just one uh, application, Kakotok, for example, in Korea is, has, um, made this uh, revenue of 90% or more to disappear from three telcos in Korea, KT, SKT, LG, uh, U+. And this is a big, big impact on their uh, revenue and operations, okay? Um, and then the MOOC-based ed education by edX, Coursera, and so on, and we've been doing that for the last uh, couple of years uh, for po uh, from post-tech for industry people in Korea. Well, actually, because it's uh, internet-based, we have people joining from all over the world as well uh, for free uh, education on AI, big data, IoT, and block blockchain. And uh, as some of you may or may not agree, blockchain is coming, and we'll see more applications, uh, more blockchains, which are uh, P2P networks on the internet, and these don't, cannot exist without the internet. And just a, a quick, so I'm chairing this conference on blockchain and uh, cryptocurrency. It's a technical 
not those uh, dog and pony show. Um, IEEE Communication Society uh, agreed to sponsor this uh, conference, first conference in Seoul, Korea on, in May. So if you're interested, you're welcome to join us. Um, so the, the core of uh, the, my message, so what does network software errorization mean? Okay. Well, it means the, the black boxes that have been deployed for the last 20, 30 plus years on the internet, well, uh, which is costing a lot of money. Perhaps we should try to change these to white boxes, which are bare metal routers and switches with open software, okay? And in fact, this approach has been used by internet players such as Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, and so on. And they've been saving lots of lots of money, okay? Compared to telcos, compared to enterprises, compared to public network, uh, and especially their uh, data centers, okay? Using the latest uh, softwareization uh, techniques, software-defined networking, network function virtualization. Okay. All those network function boxes, middle boxes, are not being asked to be provided anymore, especially the telcos. Instead of uh, they are asking VNFs, virtual network functions, to be supplied by the solution providers. So they're not buying special hardware, special proprietary software, especially in the, as, as they're deploying 5G networks. So softwareization also involves using open source projects. Okay, ONF, Open Networking Forum, that was established between um, the uh, Stanford and Berkeley about a half dozen years ago. They've been working very hard on open networking, providing open software for uh, telcos and other organizations to use uh, on these uh, white boxes. Okay, open compute project, again, led by Facebook, um, Google, and those guys to design the hardware servers as well as switches, and then ask Taiwanese companies to provide them a very low uh, cost, but very reliable, okay? And then they uh, use Linux and, uh, and other uh, open free software, and then with their own box, with their software, so they can very quickly and cheaply deploy their data centers and so on. SDN NFP Forum, uh, the other open networking uh, projects. Of course, ITF and Etsy and Linux Foundation have been working very hard on this area as well. And these companies are um, uh, solution providers for those. And we need to hire more innovative people, software-oriented people uh, to operate and run uh, the networks. Okay? Of course, you cannot fire people that are doing a very good job but you need to re-educate them. You need to softwareize them as well so that they feel more comfortable with these uh, uh, open boxes, installing them, and then running themselves instead of just uh, buying these expensive, very uh, uh, inflexible black boxes. Okay. And uh, here's an open network reference model that uh, Huawei came out uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, here are some of the projects. And then there's more. Um, I used this one uh, about uh, last year. But uh, there are more uh, open source projects that are uh, being um, born every day. OK, I also try to um, uh, assess the softwareization status, okay? So network or data centers, enterprise networks. Well, softwareization is being done very, very slowly, okay? 
research networks a little better, uh, people a little more open-minded, and so it's slowly coming. Telcos, still very slow. Okay. Now, the 5G core networks, yes, definitely. And they're not, again, uh, with the new uh, networks that they're deploying, uh, they are using these uh, NFE technology, um, the softwareized uh, systems. Public networks, very slow. Data centers, cloud service providers, Google, Apple, Facebook, uh, Microsoft, and so on. Yes, their data centers are very much uh, softwareized. Okay? Uh, very lean and mean, uh, very low cost uh, deployment and operations. And data centers in enterprises, still very slow. Data centers of telcos, they're very slow as well. Well, this is my personal assessment. You may agree or may disagree. Okay. So, to conclude uh, my 20-minute talk, so the internet has been growing continuously over the fa past 50 years. Professor Chun uh, gave a nice history of the internet. Okay, worldwide as well as uh, Asia, um, and has become an essential infrastructure okay, in whatever we do. And it will continue to grow and support more applications, including blockchain applications and services, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, but the inter internet infrastructure needs to be softwareized which means uh, more affordable, more flexible, more agile, so that the new services can be provided very quickly instead of waiting for some vendor to provide this functionality in these boxes six months later or a year later or even longer. Okay. And the networks need to be smarter. Okay. They need to be automated, become more intelligent, and eventually self-driving using the latest artificial intelligence technology. I'm not saying you don't have to learn, I'm not saying you have to learn to become the AI experts. I'm not saying you need to learn or become AI researchers. However, you have lots of data in your operations, using those data, just learn the tools. There are many, many tools of the machine learning tools that you can apply and perhaps use it to run your networks more efficiently and more intelligently. Okay. And of course, more R&D is needed in this area in order to achieve these. Finally, uh, people need to be softwareized as well. And here, with this, I thank you for inviting me, and hopefully uh, this quick 20-minute uh, presentation gave you some idea on softwareization of the internet. Thank you. So thank you very much for your keynote. Really appreciate uh, you taking the time to come and join our conference. Thank you very much. Right, eyes again. Okay, I would now like to, well, I think this takes us into all the closing uh, bits and pieces, the remarks and the comments and so forth. So I'd like to thank our two keynote speakers for um, starting off our closing plenary. Uh, next up, I would like to invite Paul Wilson, the Director General of APNIC, to deliver his closing remarks. Paul.
Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, I'll start uh, by uh, repeating, replaying some of the sentiments we've heard today. Uh, it's been a very nice conference, a very nice Apricot 2019. A lot of great content, a lot of participation. I've seen some really packed sessions and, and a lot of interactions with the, with the audience, which is always great to see. Uh, so I hope you've all enjoyed it uh, as much as I did. Thanks to everyone who attended the APNIC uh, annual general meeting uh, just now. Uh, we had uh, elections as we do at this time uh, every year for four positions on the APNIC Executive Council. That's the governing board of, of APNIC elected by the members. And I'd like to congratulate the four EC members who were elected today, uh, Yue Dong, Maz, Garab and Kenny. Congratulations to you all. We've had, a, we've had a brief meeting as well in which Garab has been re-elected as the chair of APNIC, uh, Rajesh as secretary, and Kenny as treasurer. So congrats to you all, and thanks again from APNIC very sincerely to our retiring EC members, uh, Izumi Okatani and Jessica Shen, who've um, both contributed hugely to the EC and to APNIC over a few years now. The two, uh, those two will be missed uh, very much by the EC, but uh, we all hope that they'll come and, uh, and see us again quite often. So uh, I'm sure that this meeting has given us all a lot to think about and a lot to do when we get home in particular. And that's the whole point, uh, so that we can all go home to make our networks uh, better and bigger and faster and more secure. Uh, what I always say is the difference between a network that is uh, stable and secure and efficient and sustainable and one that is none of these things can be just solely in the experience, uh, the knowledge, uh, the expertise of those who run those networks. I think in this room we all, we all know that and it's a challenge that we all share. I mean, after all, I'm sort of sorry to mention this, but um, we did have a few issues with the network uh, this week and from what I hear, it didn't have to do with hardware failures or backhoes going through cables. It's a, a, just a really good illustration of the importance of what we're doing here, which is sharing and building the knowledge and skills to avoid things like that, to create a better internet. So uh, no matter how great the bandwidth is or how great the infrastructure, it's still the human factor that um, plays the most important part in making sure that the services are still running. Uh, back to the challenges, uh, and the one that I, I, I last mentioned, which is security. That's probably the most important and urgent thing for a lot of us. Uh, I know, we know at APNIC that across the APNIC community, security is at the top of the list of challenges that, uh, that the APNIC members, uh, network operators around the region, um, face. So it's really the most important and urgent thing for, uh, for most, if not all of us in the room. So after this week, I hope that uh, something that many of us are more aware of uh, is various aspects of security. Um, in particular, at APNIC, we've been working on RPKI as a really critical thing that relates directly to our responsibility for the registration and management of IP addresses. Um, we've been working on it for quite a few years now. Um, it will provide, it's always promised, and it, and it is actually the, starting to uh, live up to or are starting to touch on that promise at least of, um, of bringing important improvements to routing security around the world and we all know how many uh, routing incidents uh, both uh, deliberate and accidental are starting to emerge uh, on the internet these days. So I hope the meeting here has given us all some good ideas uh, no matter where we are in the learning curve some good ideas about um, RPKI and, uh, and things to do when we get when we get home, as I said, uh, like uh, creating ROAs, uh, route origin authentications or authorizations for your address blocks. Uh, in that regard, I want to um, give a special uh, thanks to uh, Mark Tinker and Job Schneiders for arranging this really innovative um, RPKI ROA signing party on uh, Wednesday. It was sort of a mashup uh, between a dance club a, a very geeky gathering um, to talk about routing security stuff and, uh, and a whiskey boff. And uh, so it was a really um, a fun initiative and I hope that um, people enjoyed themselves whether they were geeking out on, on, um, on rowers or uh, 
uh, dancing to the to the uh, DJ or or um, having a whiskey or or three. Um, I want to mention that uh, APNIC 48 will be happening in Chiang Mai in September, and we are planning a bigger focus on RPKI at that uh, at that meeting. Not solely R RPKI, there'll be something there for others, but um, but RPKI really is one of the priorities that we have for for this year. So just wrapping up, uh, sincere thanks from APNIC to um, our hosts from KISTI and from the other Korean organizations that welcomed us here at the conference, uh, KISA, KAST and others. And uh, thanks to you all for making this a, a really memorable and, uh, and successful event. S thanks to all the sponsors who we'll be thanking uh, and recognizing in a moment. We couldn't do these meetings without that support. Um, as, and Talking about uh, essential um, people, uh, thanks uh, very much to the Apricot Board, uh, to Philip Smith, of course, uh, in particular, and thanks to the APNIC staff and, uh, and all who worked uh, alongside Apricot with a Apricot uh, to make this happen. And uh, last but not least, uh, thanks to all of you for, for being here. The Apricot community is a fantastic community. It includes APNIC members and others, and you've all gone to a lot of effort to, to be here and to participate so well as, uh, as I mentioned early. So thanks very much for the energy and uh, enthusiasm that you've put into it. Uh, we've got a closing social uh, tonight that's hosted by APNIC. I do hope uh, you will all join us there uh, for that, bus seats uh, permitting, and um, also uh, after that, have a very safe trip home. Uh, see you at uh, APNIC 48 in Chiang Mai and or the next Apricot uh, 2020, wherever that happens to be, right? Thank you all. Thanks, Philip. Okay, Philip will now return to his run sheet rather than trying to make it up as he goes along. Um, well, putting my glasses on will help. Um, thanks very much, Paul. I would now like to invite um, Sun Wu Kwang, the General Director of National Supercomputing Division of KISTI, to give his closing remarks on behalf of KISTI. Thank you. Thanks, Philip. Uh, as a host of uh, APRICON, 2019, I'm really honored to make this closing speech here today. As the largest internet campus in the Asia Pacific region, over 800 experts from more than uh, 50 countries in the, in the area of network technology, research, operation, and policy have participated in Gave Life to Africa 2019. I think Africa 2019 offered an open and cooperative venue for us to share uh, our skills, experiences, and knowledge, knowledge of how to efficiently and effectively operate the internet in the Asia Pacific region. Indeed, over the past 10 days, we have been able to discuss and identify the current state and relevant issues of Asia-Pacific Internet technology through presentations, workshops, tutorials, and conferences and forums. I'm sure that uh, it was a valuable time for, uh, for all of us to think about ways and options available on the road for the further develop the internet for our futures. Uh, my special thanks to the officials of APRICOT and APNIC and APAN for their support. I also want to say special thanks to the Korean Ministry of Science and I ICT and to the Korean High Performance Networking uh, Research Community for their support for making this wonderful event happening. Especially, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to Ujin Sok, chief of uh, the KISTI Cronet Center and his team. They are really the one uh, who was really 
who have really hard, worked hard behind the scene for about two years in preparation of hosting this uh, excellent international conference. Congratulations to the successful completion of APRICOT 2019 and APNIC 47 this year. The next APRICOT conference will be held in summer in 2020. <laughs> and APRICOT 2020 is expected to have much richer contents and various topics will be more widely discussed at a one-step advanced level. I believe that APRICOT 2020 will contribute to the further development of internet technology in the SPR Pacific region. Uh, in closing, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to all attendees for your active participation during the last 10 days. I hope you all have a safe trip back to your home on your home countries and wish you all the best. Again, my sincere thanks to everyone for being here. So now, now it's my turn to just give you a few statistics and um, other details about um, this event that we've, we've had here. Um, so this is really just my vote of thanks. Um, you know, I want, would like to echo what um, Paul and um, Soon Wook have said um, about the event so far. But c before I come to that, um, just some numbers. Um, we had 714 total registrations for the event, in other words, people who've checked in and participated in the conference over the last two weeks. Of that number, we had 125 for the workshops, including instructors. Uh, the workshops were last week, uh, alongside the APAN 47 cons uh, conference that Sunwork mentioned. Um, so that was a wonderful opportunity for workshop participants and instructors to mingle with the APAN. Um, community, the researchers and the network um, operators who uh, were taking part in that, in that event. Um, also for the numbers, we had 34 fellows this year. We actually had 40 vacancies available, um, but 34 fellows um, participated in the event. Um, some missed out, unfortunately, due to visa or um, late cancellation issues, um, unavoidable cancellation issues. What else? Um, top 10 economy, economy attendee numbers. Um, it's kind of interesting. Korea with 127, Japan 81, US 70, Hong Kong 66, Australia 67, Philippines 55, Singapore 45, Bangladesh 32, Indonesia 28, and China 25. Um, the Australian number is high because, um, of course, a lot of us come from Australia, including the Apricot staff and the APNIC Secretariat. Um, but even with that, um, we, we include this in the list. So it's very good participation. Very happy to see the participation we had from Korea. 57 economies represented, and we had a total of 40 sponsors. You can see the wonderful sponsor list on the, on the side of the, the ballroom here. So we really, really appreciate um, um, the support from all our many sponsors. I'd like to thank all our keynote speakers, um, Andrew Sullivan, Jemin Chung, Kalnam Chan, and James Hong for the interesting, diverse, and varied uh, keynote speeches, both in the opening and the closing plenaries. Um, it's always interesting to try and have uh, good keynotes, different keynotes, diverse opinions and so forth as, as part of our apricots. And you know, we try to tap into the Korean internet community and science and technology community uh, for our keynotes, as you saw this year. And we really appreciate um, Jemin Chung, Kilnam Chan, and James Hong for their willingness to be part of this um, conference. 
Going through the thank yous, uh, the workshop instructor team came from, well, mostly all the way around the world to take part in the workshops last week. Some of them managed to stay on for a few days this week. Um, we realize Apricot's a two-week event and is quite a long time away from home for uh, many folks. So we appreciate those instructors who managed to stay on for the conference week. Thank you to all the presenters, the tutorial instructors, the session chairs, the program committee, of whom 25 members um, um, made up the committee. They were working since well, more or less eight, late October, early November on the conference program. I would like to thank Mark Tinker and Mariana Novakovic for chairing the PC and doing all the wrangling of the program. It's a lot of work behind the scenes that many of you don't see to assemble the program. Um, inevitably, with parallel sessions, we always have the challenge of trying to make sure that um, there are no conflicts, but we always seem to end up with sessions where everybody wants to go to everything that's happening. So it's just the nature of how we have with Apricot. So the PC is very aware and tries its best to have as much variety uh, for participants. Um, we'd like to thank all the Apricot Fellows um, and everyone who applied for a fellowship. Um, we had 390 applications for 40 places. Um, so I'd like to thank Aftab Siddiqui and Rupesh Shrestha for chairing the fellowship committee and all the fellowship committee for the reviews. Um, we whittled down the initial 390 to around 200. Reviewing 200 applications is a big job and we really appreciate the fellowship committee for doing that. I'd like to give a shout out to John Rattray for really coordinating and looking after the fellows while they've been here on site. Um, and that way, the, the newcomers, some of them hadn't even traveled outside the home country um, before they came to Apricot. So it's quite intimidating to come to a new country, especially um, where there's a different language. So I want to appreciate John for looking after the fellows for that. I'd like to thank all the team at KISTI for all their assistance in the local organization support, supporting us working with all the suppliers, especially, again, Busong Cho and Chen Jin Pai for all the extensive laser and work they've been doing. They have worked tirelessly for really the last two, two and a half, three weeks to make sure everything was in place and ready for this event. Bearing in mind that this event was held alongside APAN 47, they had quite a bit of work uh, to do to support APAN 47 as well. So I'd like to thank Busong and Chen Jin and the whole team at KISTI for really an excellent amount of work that they have done um, to support us. I'd like to thank KISTI for the 10 gigabits internet access they provided from um, KISTI um, building, which is not far from here, as some of you probably saw, to here in DCC. Um, as Paul mentioned, we had connectivity issues, um, and those affected our upstream providers on Tuesday and Wednesday. Unfortunately, out of our control is just a nature of one of these things um, on the internet. Um, we're sorry that it happened, but you know, I'm sure you appreciate that it's just, it's just one of those, those things that were really unlucky um, with the timing. The, comp the network had been working perfectly due the APAN week, and we just ran into those issues on Tuesday and Wednesday. I hope it hasn't spoiled the enjoyment of the event. I'd like to thank our co-organizers, APNIC, um, all the APNIC staff, the Secretariat, for all the support. Uh, the, Ap the Apricot event organizer, Molly Chim, for all the hard work starting almost 18 months ago to make this event reality. We were here in April uh, 2017, Cherry blossom time, it was absolutely amazing going around here outside the venue with all the cherry blossom along the roadsides and so forth. So it made us really excited to come, even though at the end of February, it's not quite cherry blossom season yet. Um, also to thank um, the APNIC web team who've been updating the Apricot website in real time, more or less as the event has been happening. Really appreciate all the work that they've been doing there. Also, thank you to the volunteer team that's made up the Apricot sec Secretariat, uh, both those who've come uh, with us from overseas, uh, as well as the local team who've been supporting um, us here. Um, with that, I'd like to acknowledge our sponsors. Um, we have, as I said earlier, an impressive list of sponsors. Um, and what I'd like to do, I'd like to inv invite Paul to come up and help me um, give special recognition to the sponsors. We have um, small gifts to give them. Um, 
just to show our appreciation. As Paul said, we cannot do this event without um, our sponsors. Um, it's a significant contribution, and we hope they get as much out of Apricot event as we do. This lets us keep the registration fee low um, and to make the event really as enjoyable as it is. Okay, so now So, I think, where would you like me? Here? So, Paul, so, think, if you wave and I shout out. Footsteps on the floor. <laughs> We're positioned for the photographer. Right. <laughs> okay. It's a long list, so I'm going to try and go through as quickly as I can. Um, so, first off, I'd like to invite Kisti, our host and our opening social sponsor, to receive a small token of appreciation from us. Yep. Soon work, please. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We'd, we'd like you to open it. We thought we'd wrap it nicely rather than presenting just a box on stage. So, yeah, just. We won't open all the others, so don't worry. This is not going to take all night. <laughs> it's like unwrapping presents like I do, carefully not to tear it. Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, it was upside down, but no. Hold it up. Yeah. <laughs> right. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have Dime. The Dejeon International Marketing Enterprise. Do we have a representative? Ah, yes. I'd like to invite our platinum sponsor, Adrex, to receive a small token. And next up, our gold sponsor, Lynx. One of our gold sponsors, Lynx. And our other gold sponsor, Verisign. Nobody from... Nope, no Verisign. Okay, so... Um, we next would like to invite our peering social sponsor, Equinix. No Equinix. 
Um, our closing social sponsor, Epinic. We, we didn't plan that very well, did we? Nope. Okay, next up, um, a fellowship sponsor, Internet Society. Um, our coffee cart sponsor, Netflix, with all that wonderful coffee. The first of our community sponsors, AWS. So we have community sponsor Facebook, um, who are not um, here. They've already left the event. Uh, Google also, we want to thank them for their community sponsorship. So the next community sponsor is ICANN. Again, thank you for your support. Andy? Um, also community sponsor, Network Startup Resource Center. I think that's meant to be me who's accepting it. <laughs> yes. Stay back. Just to be clear, I taught the workshop last week for NSRC, so I've picked it up on their behalf. Steve Hooter has already returned home. Um, also want to recognize our community sponsor, Tain CC. They've already uh, left the event earlier today. Um, as has our silver sponsor, Adva Optical. They have also uh, already departed. So the next one I would like to recognize our silver sponsor is AMSIX. And the next silver sponsor at Tokyo. Um, our silver sponsor, Hilco. Nobody from Hilco here? No? Nope. All right. Um, our next silver sponsor, IPV4 Mall. No. 
Um, our, sponsor, our silver sponsor, Nexus Guard, has already left. Um, our silver sponsor, Nokia. Paresh has realized he's the only one. <laughs> Um, our silver sponsor, NS Focus, would like to recognize. They've already left um, earlier. Um, recognize Paracum, our other silver sponsor. A silver sponsor, Seiko, who provided all these lovely clocks, including the one you can see in front of you. Um, next silver sponsor, SK Broadband. Is anybody from SK here? Nope. All right. Our next silver sponsor, Telstra. Our next silver sponsor, True Internet, our data center have already left the event. Um, our next silver sponsor is Zenlayer. Anybody from Zenlayer? Nope. All right. Want to recognize um, Akamai for sponsoring the Tech Girl Social. Next, our bronze sponsor, Apji. Any Apji? No Apji. Okay. Um, next bronze sponsor, Dot Asia, have already left um, for the for going home. Um, next bronze sponsor is JPIX. JPIX. Our next bronze sponsor, JP Knapp. Thank you. 
Our next bronze sponsor, PCCW Global. No PCCW. Uh, next one up, uh, uh, oh, yes. Oh, right. Our next um, bronze sponsor was SGIX, who have already left the event. So now we move on to the APNIC AGM sponsors. Uh, first up, we have CNNIC. Next up, we have uh, JP Nick for the AGM sponsor. And the next AGM sponsor, PH Colo. And our final AGM sponsor, TW Nick. I think that is us. Did I miss anybody? No. Hope not. Anyway, thank you. Thank you very much for helping with this, Paul. <laughs> That's it. I forgot one. <laughs> How could I forget? <laughs> Paul, could you come back, please? <laughs> You've forgotten your gift and, yeah. <laughs> is, that the, is that the one that's missing? Or is yes, one this is yours oh, okay. for AP Nick. Okay. So anyway, we did that. <laughs> we did do it earlier, didn't we? Hmm? We did do it earlier, didn't we? Yes, we did. Did we do a picture? Do you want another picture? Okay. Yes. So, okay. Yes, we did do. We did give the gift to APNIC as the closing social sponsor um, earlier. It's just that, um, in all our excitement for recognizing all the other sponsors, um, we forgot to give Paul his gift to take back to his seat. Okay. So, normally at this time, like three minutes before uh, we finish, we have a promotional video for Apricot 2020. 
we're all, we were, so I'll tell you, tell you the little story. It's, there will be LibreCon 2020, so don't worry. Until about, it would be about just over two weeks ago, we were all set to go to Fiji. Um, I mean, the board had pretty much made that decision a few months ago. Um, we, we, inspect, we went to visit three locations, and um, the board decided that Fiji matched the outreach ambitions for Apricot to really cover the region, um, providing not only a venue for internet operations and uh, peering meetings and the APNA, um conference as well, but um, just to carry on our outreach uh, um, around the region. It was about three weeks ago that the venue informed us that um, the renovations that they had planned for pretty much the next two, three months were going to take place in January and February next year. February next year is a little bit inconvenient for us because that's when we had hoped to do our event. So our backup plan was to go to, um, where were we going again? It was Melbourne in Australia. So that's where we're going to go. So. So that's why it's kind of a little bit fraught because I, I haven't really invited a partner because we've just really had the informal discussions about partnership. The, the folks in the Pacific community were all set and ready and so forth, but um, unfortunately with the venue um, disappearing, um, we've, we had to do a last minute move. At least this wasn't like the last minute move we had to do before where it was six weeks before the conference. So we've had a good year's notice about this. So the, the, the time will be the same. We have, we have two venues um, on the short list. Um, so it will be in, in, in Melbourne um, city centre. Um, so after this event, basically Molly and I will be going back to finalise the venue and then get um, work underway with doing this. I hope that the Internet Association of Australia and OSDOG don't mind me saying that, you know, we hope we'll be partnering with them to deliver the event. It's Osnog, of course, as you know, is in September every year. Um, so our February event um, has no impact on Osnog. But they're a significant part of the Australian internet community. And of course, this is the Pacific-based um, um, apricot. Um, so we hope that you'll be able to come. We'll have a very big focus on getting folks from the Pacific to come to Melbourne in Australia to be a part of the event. So we're very excited to do it. Um, I suppose in some way it's easier for us at Apricot because we are in Brisbane. Okay, that's about two and a half hours flying from uh, Melbourne, so it's still a fair old hike. Um, but at least it's roughly the same language and we do have the same currency. So um, it should be, in some sense, an easier event for us to produce and an easier event for our co-organizer, Ape. APNIC to actually assist us with as well. So we're very excited about that. Um, the other thing about the next year's one is it's the 25th Apricot. Um, so with, we're planning it'll be a bigger party than usual. Um, so we haven't quite thought what that big party will be, but 25th anniversary of anything is really a very significant um, event. Apricot, as you know, started in 1996. Um, and it's been growing and, I suppose, morphing and being more inclusive as, as years go by. And you know, we're very proud of what we have achieved. Um, and we're happy that you ca the, the community carries on supporting us in all the diverse places we go to. Um, we do realize that you know, we don't hold apricot in an airport hotel every single year. We do try and be part of the community work with the local internet community to help improve internet infrastructure. Um, that was the mission of Apricot right from the start. We want to carry on with that mission. Um, and we'll, you know, we appreciate the support. Those of you who came to Kathmandu last year um, kind of were wondering why we did it last year. Um, this year's Apricot was joint with APAN, um, hosted by Kisti, who are based here in Daejeon. So as, as Paul noted, it was bit more effort for a lot of you to come, um, but we really, really appreciate. The attendance numbers are very impressive. I know a lot of you didn't go to the sessions, but you had a lot of other meetings elsewhere around the venue, and we appreciate that. 
So on that final note, um, 2020, Melbourne, Australia, uh, last two weeks of February. Um, if you do plan to come, please plan to come for a month or so. Um, there's a lot to see in the country. Please don't fly to Sydney and drive to Melbourne unless you're going to allow a day, I mean a full 24-hour day. It does take 12 hours non-stop, or maybe 11. Um, so it is a big country. Australia physically is the size of the United States, so don't assume it's some little island in the, in the ocean. Um, as for 2021, um, we want to try and get that one sorted out. It will be in Southeast Asia, um, so that's probably a relief for a lot of you who have had to travel a fair old distance to even get to this one. So it will be in Southeast Asia. We're looking at uh, three possibilities. Um, quite likely, we'll be going back to uh, a location that you've, you're already familiar with. So we hope in the next two months to finalize all that detail. So a bit more planning for you uh, thinking forwards. Anyway, on that note, um, what else do I have to say? I must look at my run list. So I've done that. So the only other thing really is the social event. Um, we have seven buses which start leaving at 6.30 p.m. from outside the convention center. Um, once a bus is full, it will leave. Once all seven buses have gone, that's it. Um, so about 300 seats on those buses. So I would suggest that once we conclude here, that you go back, drop your bags, or if you're not staying in the hotels around here, um, that you get yourself ready to go to the social event. Um, it was the venue of the APAN opening social. It's quite a spectacular building, uh, quite an ancient building, so I hope you will come along and enjoy it with us all. And on that note, thank you all, all of you for, well, pretty much lasting the whole week here at Apricot. Please do enjoy the social event, um, and we will see you in 2020 in Melbourne. Thank you very much.